Well, good morning, church. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Sam, and I'm one of the lay elders here. And it's a great privilege to be here with you this morning to proclaim God's word to you. Uh, Let's turn in our Bibles to Philippians chapter 2. And we're going to read the first 11 verses of Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, reading from verse 1. So, if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Let's pray one more time. Our gracious God and Father, we are so thankful that we can come before your most holy presence, that we can open up your holy inspired scriptures, and that we can glean your truths in them. We pray that you will speak to each of our hearts this morning, that you will transform us and conform us more and more to the image and person of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. We ask it all in our Saviour's name. Amen. I'm not a big fan of flying. This probably has to do with the fact that so much of the aviation industry depends on the plane's attitude. Now, I'm not speaking about the plane's mood, or disposition, but I am speaking about the way that the plane positions itself in the air, whether it's soaring upwards towards the heaven or whether it's tilting downwards towards the earth. The key to maintaining this crucial balance is something called the plane's attitude indicator. This small instrument, unassuming, is vital in guiding the pilot through uncertain skies, and especially when visibility is very low and it's difficult to see the horizon. It's critical for the safety of the aeroplane and its flight. Take, for instance, the case of Piper Aerostar. In December 2019, it was navigating under a shroud of darkness, but everything seemed fine. All was going well. Everything was under control until something happened. Something malfunctioned, the attitude indicator of the plane. And in a terrifying moment, the pilot lost his sense of the horizon. He lost this important gauge. The result was catastrophic. The plane spiraled out of control and hit down on Gabriola Island. Now, I don't tell you this event to put you off flying, but only to show you and to tell you the chilling reminder that there is a danger when we lose the right attitude. This concept of attitude is not only important in aviation, but it's critical and crucial in the spiritual lives of Christians. When Paul wrote to the Philippians, he was addressing a community grappling with internal struggles that threatened their unity 
They were moved with selfish ambitions and a drive for individual recognition and promotion, often overshadowing the community good. But like the Philippians, we also can become engulfed in our own interests, in self-promotion, in self-centeredness, and in self-ambition. Paul offers a solution to this issue, to this problem. With a clear and striking exhortation, he says, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours, in Christ Jesus. He calls the believers in Philippi and us to recalibrate our spiritual attitude indicator, to shift our mindsets away from self-centeredness and self-interest, to realign with the humility and the selflessness of Jesus Christ the Lord. Just as a pilot relies on the attitude indicator for guidance, so we, as the people of God, must rely on Christ's example of humility if we are to live in unity and bring glory to his name and protect our gospel witness. And so, brothers and sisters, my hope this morning is that as we explore this text together, we will learn to keep our minds on the horizon aligned with that of Christ. And to this end, Paul is going to bring up three points. He's going to point us to three things that will help us on our road. Firstly, he's going to focus on the foundations of our unity from verses 1 to 4. Secondly, he is going to bring before us the greatest example of humility, Christ. And lastly, he is going to show us that ultimately, humility triumphs, the triumph of humility. Let's look at the foundations of our unity in verses 1 to 4. Paul commences this chapter with the use of a very simple word, so. This word takes us back to the preceding chapter, chapter 1, and the last section of that chapter from verses 27 to 30. And in that section, Paul had been reminding the Philippians of the shared bond that they had as they struggled and defended the gospel. He lays out there what it means to live a life that's truly worthy of the gospel, which is a life of unity and fearlessness in the face of opposition and adversity. The people of God standing together side by side as one in defense of the gospel. Look at how he puts it in verse 27 of chapter 1. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. Having reminded them of this truth, Paul now deepens this narrative in this chapter that we are looking at. He wants to remind them further of the divine blessings which they have that serve as a foundation to their unity. And so he says, if, so, if, and I know if I continue just interpreting one word, we'll be here for a long time, but bear with me a moment. He says, if, let's pause here. Why does Paul say, if there is? Is there doubt or uncertainty with Paul? Does he not believe these statements that he is making? Not at all. Paul is expressing no doubt, but rather he is employing a rhetorical tool which inevitably nudges us, leads us, to respond, yes, we have all these blessings in abundance. These are certainties in Christ, the foundation of our communal life. So let's take a closer look at these. He starts by referring in verse 1 to the encouragement or comfort that we have in Christ. I know many of us were discouraged, disappointed, saddened when we heard about the Christian situation his sin, and his ultimate disqualification. But I trust that you found encouragement in Christ and in the community of the members at ECC. The Apostle Paul himself, he knew personally of this experience 
of encouragement and comfort. In 2 Timothy verse, chapter 4, verse 16, we read these words. At my first defense, no one came to stand by me, but all deserted me. May not be charged against them. Look at verse 17. But the Lord stood by me and strengthened me. The Lord is our encourager in times of difficulty and trials. Then, Paul speaks of comfort from love. Now, as you consider this clause, we notice that it's intentionally ambiguous. It doesn't say comfort from love of God or from Christ, but it could be. It could be love from God, love from Christ, or it could be that shared love that Paul shared with the Philippians. I like to think of this one as that love that comes from God, because John reminds us that God is love. And Paul, in Romans chapter 5, reminds us that God's love has been poured out into our hearts, into the hearts of the people of God through the Holy Spirit. This is a downpour of divine love, filling us with comfort that can come only from him. Then there is participation in the Spirit. This is about the fellowship that we have with one another, the people of God. The Apostle Paul speaks of this in 2 Corinthians as the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. And we're going to see a beautiful picture of that this morning when we partake of communion together, that one bread, that one cup, which shows us that we are united together and with Christ, the Lord and Savior. It's about a shared life, fellowship with one another. It's about being knit together in love with one another. Lastly, we come to affection and sympathy. Now, Jesus taught us to love one another. We see that in John chapter 13, verses 34 to 35. And Paul is calling us to embody this love through affection and sympathy. It's more than just having feelings for one another, but it's actually stepping into one another's shoes. It's considering each other and carrying each other's burdens. That's why we have a covenant, because we speak there of the one another commands, how we can care for one another, how we can think of one another, how we can love one another, how we can show affection and sympathy to one another. Colossians chapter 3, verse 12, articulates this wonderfully. This is what it says. Put on then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. These are the foundations of our unity, the blessings that bring the people of God together. But they're not just for our individual enjoyment. They are for our community to bring us together, to knit us together in love. Because you see, the gospel doesn't just save us, it knits us together in Christ. And so we see the foundations of the unity. But let me ask you a question and play along with me. Are these divine blessings real? Let's play along. Let me ask you a series of questions and let me hear your response. Is there any encouragement in Christ? Yes. Is there any comfort from love? Is there any participation in the Spirit? Is there any affection? Is there any sympathy? Yes, we have these in abundance. And if that is so, then Paul says, complete my joy. Complete my joy. And how do we do that? How do we complete Paul's joy? Well, look at verse 2. By being of the same mind. This is Paul's key takeaway. This is his main point, that one thing that he wants us to remember from this section, being of the same mind. The sense is that we're on the same page. It's not now uniformity, but it's unity in thought and purpose. But the question is, how do we express this same mind in reality? 
What does it look like to have the same mind? Well, Paul will give us and show us what that looks like. As we consider the verse, we'll see that Paul lists out a number of items which are to be present in those who are showing that they are of the same mind. He gives us, as it were, a checklist. And this checklist is not for the faint-hearted. He talks about having the same love, having the same love, check. He talks about being of full accord, check. He talks about being of one mind, check. How about no selfishness? Uh, well, can we skip this one? It's a little bit difficult. He talks about thinking of others better than yourself. Well, that really is a tough one, Paul. You're really pushing it here. He talks about looking after others' interests. All right, Paul, now you're really meddling. We can't live this. It's too difficult. It's easy to think that, that these Request this life is too difficult, that Paul is setting the bar too high, but he's calling us to a life that reflects the depths of that which we have received as the people of God. Theologian Diedrich Bonhoeffer said this, the church is the church only when it exists for others. I know these are difficult things, church, but through the help of of the Spirit of God. We can live this out in our community. So let me ask you, do we exist for one another? Do we? Do we put others first? Do we consider others more highly than ourselves? Do we put our ECC community first so that there might be unity amongst us? Or are we captivated only by our own needs and selfish ambitions. Imagine what it will look like if we truly lived out and had the same mind. Many of you may have heard of Abraham Maslow. He created Maslow's hierarchy of needs. He was one of the giant thinkers of the 20th century, and he brought a radical shift of perspective in the fields of psychology and psychiatry. He began an entirely new approach to therapy, actually, as he realized the importance of persons to find purpose outside of themselves. And unlike Freud, who studied sick people and dysfunctional people, Maslow took the opposite approach, studying people who were vitally alive and fully functioning. He called them radiantly happy whole persons, just like my wife. He introduced the concept of self-actualization, and in his research, he wrote this. Without exception, I found that every person who was sincerely happy, radiantly alive, was living for a purpose or course beyond himself. This aligns seamlessly with what Paul has been exhorting the Philippians and us to live a life that is marked by humility and selflessness. And I know that I've witnessed this in this community. I know that when we were shifting to the one service, for many of you, that was difficult. With your schedules, it made it very difficult. But you humbled yourself. You thought about others beyond yourself. I've seen this when there have been sick members in hospital, and many of you have gone out to visit them, have stayed with them, have prayed with them, I've seen this where there has been need in the church, and many of you have taken the time to cook and prepare food for them. I've seen this in our prayer meeting, when we've come together as the people of God to bring members of our congregation before the throne of God and petition on their behalf. Brothers and sisters, let's continue to pray that the Holy Spirit will give us further opportunity and capacity to show acts of selflessness within our community. And so, we've examined together the foundations of our unity in Christ. We've said a big yes. These are all existing within us. They bring us together. They unite us. We've articulated Paul's main idea to be of the same mind. But the question is, how can we really live this out? How 
do we become humble Christians? And Paul will answer that in our next section, where he brings before us the example of Christ. Look at verse 5. Paul there starts with an imperative, or if you like, an invitation. He says, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. What mind? This mind. The mind that he has just been alluding to in the previous section. That mind of selflessness, humility, love, and care for one another. Have this mind. But then he's going to point us forward, which is yours, or which is also in Christ Jesus. And that's when we'll see the example of Christ. So he takes us back, and now he brings us forward. But the question is, the question we're all asking is, how do we adopt this mindset? How do we become humble? It's a difficult question to answer. Perhaps it's about praying more. Perhaps it's about attending church more. Perhaps it's about helping each other more. It could be all those things. But I like what Martin Lowe Jones says. He was asked the same question. And you know what, what he says? Here's his response. A friend was asking me the other day, how can I be humble? He felt there was pride in him, and he wanted to know how to get rid of it. He seemed to think that I had some patent remedy and could tell him, do this, that, and the other, and you will be humble. I said, I have no method or technique. I can't tell you to get down on your knees and believe in prayer because I know you will soon be proud of that. There's only one way to be humble, and that is, he says, to look into the face of Jesus Christ. You cannot be anything else when you see him. That is the only way. Humility is not something you can create within yourself. Rather, you look at him, you realize who he is and what he has done, and you are humbled. And that's what Paul does in this next section. He says, look at Jesus, realize who he is and what he has done, and you will be humbled. So, brothers and sisters, church, let's take a look at Jesus. Look at verse 6. Who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God something to be grasped. What does it mean that Christ was in the form of God? It means that Christ, in his pre-existent state, possessed the very nature of God, verily God. It means that he is divine in the same way that God the Father is divine. It means that he embodies all the essential attributes and characteristics of divinity. When John wrote his gospel, he starts that gospel with these words, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He's speaking about Jesus there. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, also speaking about Jesus says, he is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. Jesus is God. He embodies all the essential attributes and characteristics of divinity. And yet, this one who is God, we read that he did not count equality with God something to be grasped. He did not consider equality with God something that he should exploit for his own advantage, for his own purposes. But rather, he relinquished these. And that really fits in well with our context when Paul says to us, do nothing out of selfish ambition. We see that so clearly in Christ. He did nothing out of selfish ambition. He did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. Consider this. Think about it for a moment. Here is Christ possessing all the divine attributes, the creator and sustainer of the universe, and yet he chose a different path, the path of humility, the path that cared and looked for the interests of others. And we read that in doing so, he emptied himself in verse 7. He emptied himself. That's the profound mystery of Christ's incarnation, that he emptied himself. Now, what does this mean, he emptied himself? 
Does it mean that Christ's divinity was diminished? Not at all. I know it says that he emptied himself, and you may think of this, if you think about math, as subtracting, but I like to think of it as addition, and that's why I never did so well in maths. It's not that he lost his divinity or his divinity was diminished, but rather it was that he added humanity to himself. He added the human nature to himself, verily God, but became truly human, the hymn writer tells us. And Colossians chapter 2, verse 9 confirms this. It says, For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. So when Jesus Christ was here as a human, he was still God. He did not relinquish, he did not lose any of his divinity. In him, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. He did not ever cease to be God. Although he did embrace our limitations, our weaknesses, as it were, in his flesh, our pain, but also our joy. He humbled himself. And this stands in stark contrast to what we see at the beginning of our Bibles in Genesis. There we see Adam's aspiration not to humble himself, but rather to exalt himself, to take the place of God. He sought to be like God. But here we see Jesus Christ, who is God, willingly step down and take on humanity. He emptied himself. But we read in verse 8 that this act of emptying wasn't the last of it. For him, that just wasn't sufficient. And Paul takes us deeper into the humility of Jesus Christ, our Lord. And here is where we find the full weight of Christ's humility. He says, And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. God's ultimate expression of love, Christ's ultimate expression of humility, the Son of God left heaven, took on humanity, sin apart, humbled himself. We read this in Isaiah 52 and 53. We read of his agonies, the pain that he suffered, the fact that he was rejected, the fact that none looked upon him and desired him, the fact that he allowed wicked men to take him and to nail him on a cruel tree. He did not exploit his equality with God. He set it aside for us, for you, for me, for sinners. The cross, the epitome of disgrace. It was reserved for the worst of criminals a public spectacle of humiliation. And Christ stooped down to this. For us, brothers and sisters, can I ask you, do you know this Jesus? Do you know this loving Savior who did not put himself first, who was selfless, who went to Calvary to die on behalf of sinners? Is he your Savior? Could you think of a greater Savior Do you know of a greater love than displayed by Jesus, that though he was rich, yet for our sakes he became poor, that we through his poverty might be made rich? Listen to these words, brothers and sisters. He did not cling to his divine rights. He did not exploit his heavenly status. He did not avoid the path of suffering, but humbled himself, bled and died so that we sinners might be reconciled to God. He was selfless. And this, Paul says, is the attitude that we should be reflecting as the people of God, an attitude of humility, an attitude of sacrifice, an attitude of selflessness, an attitude where we put others' interests before our own interests. That's what it means to be the people of God, and that's what will enable us to be united in defense of the gospel. It should reflect each and every single one of us who have claimed Christ as Savior. And so, the essence of his message is this. In our relationships with one another, aim to embody the same mindset and attitude that Christ Jesus showed. 
a mind that chooses humility over pride, a mind that embraces service over selfishness, and a mind that values obedience and uh, obedience over convenience. And so we've explored the profound humility of Christ. We've heard how Paul urges us to adopt this mindset of humility, to put others first and to sacrifice. But we know that that's not the end of the story. We know that Christ did not just suffer. He wasn't just humiliated. We know ultimately that he triumphed in his humility. And that's where our last section will take us from verses 9 to 11, the triumph of humility. In this section, Paul captures the turning point of the narrative of the Lord Jesus Christ. He starts again with a simple word, therefore, therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. The therefore is key here because it connects us to the previous section and all those actions, that humiliation that we've just considered concerning the person of Christ. But why did God highly exalt Jesus, you may be asking. One scholar has put it succinctly and nicely. I like the way he has put it. He has said that God highly exalted Jesus because of humility, because of perfect obedience, because of ex exquisite suffering, and because he died. Because of all these things, God exalted him. It's as if God is saying, because you did these things, I will lift you up beyond all others. I will honor you. We see that in Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 9. We read there, but we see him, that's Jesus, who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. Jesus crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death. And this exaltation demonstrates to us God's divine approval, Christ's vindication, heaven's amen at the completion of the work of redemption carried out by Christ. It underscores Jesus' unique status as Savior and Lord. And it acknowledges that there is none like him. There is none next to him that he is not merely a great teacher, a prophet, but he is the divine son of God, the rightful ruler of all creation. But before we move on, we must also realize that this therefore applies to us as well. Yes, specifically it speaks of Christ, but when we are united with Christ, this, therefore, applies to us as well. Because you'll remember that the previous section was really Paul bringing Christ before us as an example that we might follow him. He was bringing Christ as an example to empower us and enable us to live lives as humble servants, thinking about others' interests at much cost to ourselves, just like it cost Jesus. Therefore, if we live like this, a life of humble service, a life of humility, we also will be exalted. That's what the scripture teaches. Look at Luke chapter 18 and verse 14. This is what it reads. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. James chapter 4 and verse 10 reads, Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 5 to 7 reads, Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. This, therefore, brothers and sisters, is for us as well if we are following and seeking to live out the example of Christ. We see this so often in Scripture that those who are humble, those who suffer for God, those who are faithful are exalted. 
We think of Joseph, sold into slavery by his own brothers, wrongfully imprisoned, yet elevated to the highest place and authority in Egypt. We think of David, anointed as a young shepherd boy, but faced many trials in his life before he could claim the throne. We think of Job, a man of righteousness who lost so much, but his latter days, the scripture tells us, were more than his prior days. And then we think of Daniel, thrown into a lion's den, suffered so much in obedience to Christ, and who was ultimately given the highest place. God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. But of course, all these pale in significance with the exaltation of our Lord Jesus Christ. The word highly exalted here means not just elevation, but it's about the highest honor being bestowed upon him by God himself. This exaltation speaks of Christ being lifted up beyond human understanding and placed in the place of greatest authority and reverence. But God didn't just exalt him. We read that he also bestowed on him a name above every other name. Now, what's the significance of this name, the name above every other name? There's much debate as to what this name is, whether it's Jesus or whether it's Lord. But the key thing, the important thing, apart from the debate, is that the name represents Christ's ultimate authority and worship. In bestowing this name above every name, God the Father is not just honoring Christ, but he is revealing Christ's true nature as equal with God. And to what end was this name given? To what end was this exaltation? Look at verse 10. And again, notice these simple words, so that, so that the purpose of the exaltation and the name was so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Look at the scope of his reign and rule. It's cosmic in its magnitude. It covers heaven and earth and all those things under the earth. It encompasses beings that are celestial, terrestrial, and subterranean, the angels, humans, and all those under the earth. His exaltation, his reign, his authority is cosmic in its nature. There has been none like it because he is God. It speaks of the far-reaching dominion of Christ the Lord. Is he Lord in your life this morning? Is he? Is he Lord in your life this morning? And so in this, Paul is affirming that there is no corner of creation, no dimension of existence that is beyond the reach of Christ's lordship. Now, the imagery comes really from the Old Testament, we read those verses in our call to worship this morning from Isaiah uh, chapter 45 and verse 23. And there we read these words. And in reading these words, we remember that as Isaiah wrote, he was speaking about God. But Paul in here takes these verses and ascribes them to Christ. He says in Isaiah 45, By myself I have sworn, from my mouth has gone out righteousness, a word that shall not return to me. Every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear allegiance. This was ascribed to God. Now Paul is taking it and ascribing it to the Lord Jesus Christ, reinforcing the message that Jesus is divine, that Jesus is God, that Jesus is in equality with God. And so we see that Christ has been given the highest honor that can be afforded to him, because of his humility. And this is a present reality right now. Christ sits on the throne, but it's also a future reality, if you like. It's an eschatological truth 
That is to say that this spans not just now, but through all time into the future to the endless times. And here we read in Revelation chapter 7, and we see a snippet of this truth, of this eschatological truth that Christ is divine and he will reign supremely. There we read in Revelation chapter 7, After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. These words will echo out through all time concerning the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in the grand finale in verse 11, Paul emphasizes, lastly, that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. There is coming a day when every tongue will confess this truth. Many of you who do not know Christ have the opportunity today to confess this. Don't wait till that time. It will be too late. But every tongue will confess. And this is not just going to be mere words, but it's going to be a heartfelt acknowledgement of Christ's divine authority. Church, in the heavens, Christ is Lord. On the earth, Christ is Lord. Beneath the earth, Christ is Lord. Every tongue in creation, every tongue in humanity, every tongue in the depths will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. In closing, brothers and sisters, we have seen that the Apostle Paul was seeking to deal with the challenge that the church in Philippi had of this unity. And to this end, he appeals to them to act humbly, to walk humbly, and to prefer others. He has encouraged and exhorted us to look at Christ as our example of how we should be living the Christian life and in order for the community unity to be strengthened. Because when we live like this, we preserve this unity. We strengthen this unity and we protect the gospel witness that we are defending to the outside world. Let's pray. Our gracious God and Father, we are so thankful for our Lord Jesus Christ as we have considered him, as we have glimpsed him in your word, and we have considered that stoop which he did take, that humiliation which he willingly went into, how he suffered, bled and died for sinners lost. And we have seen also how, because of this, you exalted him and gave him the highest place that heaven can afford. Help us as we seek to live out this life, to uh, live out a life which, uh, we, where we place others before our own needs, a life where we are selfless, where we are sacrificial, and we care for one another in order to maintain uh, the unity uh, and the bond of peace that we have been so graciously granted in our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.